Hey, welcome back. Uh, it is good to be together in this way tonight as a church body. I, I, I'm thankful for your participation. It's the, the first Wednesday night, middle of the week Bible study for a new year. And I'm hopeful and asking the Lord that this year is a year that, that really things start to to, to, to be real visible in the way that he's going to use this church family and this church body. And, and I'm glad that you're a part of that. Um, and by being a part of this, you are a part of that. And so I, I'm thankful for your participation in that. Before we start tonight, as we always do, let's ask God's blessings on our time, and then we will begin uh, study together. Let's pray. God, we believe that the gospel is in motion. And we pray for more of that. Father, we pray that, that you would bless our time tonight. God, I pray that you would help us see what you want us to see in ourselves, in our church, in our faith. Father, I pray that we would see the text tonight that we would have eyes to see. God, I pray that I would get out of the way and that you would just speak to us in whatever way we need to be spoken to tonight. I pray for all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and King. Amen. We've been embarked, uh, or we've been walking through a study um, in the book of Acts over the last several months. And as I've said for several weeks now, several months even, it is a, a, a period of transition in the middle of the book of Acts, and, and we're going to continue to see that transition tonight from Peter to Paul, from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And that's going to kind of culminate in our next time together. Um, and so uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 14 in our study uh, and so I, if you got your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn there. We, we briefly talked last week about the first part of Acts chapter 13, the last time we were together. And it was that in Acts 13, we see really Saul become the Apostle Paul in that chapter. And I think it was because, as, as we closed down last week, in, a, in an effort to stem the attack of the enemy, Saul was confident in the Lord. He prayed to the Lord. Saul spoke the gospel into certain situations, and, and I think that's in large part why his name was changed. He was willing to be used. Saul was saved, but Paul was an apostle. And there's something to that. Something to being confident in the Lord. Something to engaging with culture. There's something to that. And so... We're going to see more of that tonight. Now, at the end of Acts 13, we start to see Paul's mission strategy. And he goes to as many places as he can go. And he doesn't stay at one place the same amount of time that he stays in other places based on his interaction with the local culture, the local customs. It dictates, by and large, what the Apostle Paul does. But Paul goes to a lot of different places, and his strategy is always pretty similar. He goes to the synagogue, he tries to raise up church leaders, and then he goes someplace else. Uh, typically, he is met with a lot of conflict, particularly by the Jewish leaders. And there's something that's very, very interesting in the ministry of not only the Apostle Paul, but the ministry of Jesus Christ as well. Numbers don't typically follow. And what I mean by that is the strategy for church growth for them isn't the same that it is for us. And i got to be real honest with you sometimes. I don't know how to feel about that. Like the Apostle Paul didn't always fill up a room unless it was filled up with room, with, unless it was filled up uh, with people who didn't like him, <laughs> who really wanted to aggressively attack the message that he was preaching. Jesus was really popular, but it was at the height of his popularity that the teaching of Jesus starts to become kind of hard, and people leave him. People walk away, and they kill him. The Apostle Paul walked in a lot of the same experiences. There were certainly people who loved Paul, 
there were just as many, if not more, people who didn't. Our expectations when it comes to mission, our expectations when it comes to church, I think need to change. Certainly from time to time, as we think about numerical growth, we certainly want God to save people. and We want to do what we can to grow a church. But numbers do not define success. I won't say that again. Numbers do not define success. Don't believe that the only measure of your faithfulness or this church's faithfulness or the leader's faithfulness of those, of those that you follow is measured by how many people are following. Sometimes faithfulness as an individual or as a group or as a church might mean you actually get smaller. And that's what Paul is dealing with. And there's this interesting little bit at the end of Acts 13 where Paul and Barnabas actually shake off the dust of their feet once they're driven from the city. And there is a transferable principle. Do as much as you can for as long as you can, but don't be afraid to go in a different direction. Do as much as you can for as long as you can but do not be afraid to go in a different direction. Seeking joy and seeking the Holy Spirit will give you perspective to know when that needs to happen. Being confident in the Lord like we talked about last week. Asking for wisdom as we've talked about as a church over the last several weeks. Do as much as you can for as long as you can. But do not assume that numbers equal success one way or the other. Pick it up with me in Acts 14, starting in the first verse. Now, at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue, as they always do, and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycanoia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So in the first verse, we see that the gospel is a message of unity. Both Jews and Greeks come to the same message. And we've talked about that a lot. That the gospel is a message that unites us. Both Jews and Greeks come to the same message. Now in the second verse, we see that sometimes that gospel divides. So the people, we talked about this four or five weeks ago, of, amongst the people of God, amongst the kingdom of Jesus, amongst the church, the people, there is unity built with the gospel. But in the world, the gospel divides. And that may not sound appealing to our ears, but it's just the truth. It's the way that it is. Because it forces a choice. In the second verse, some Jews who did not believe stir the pot. They did this to the point that the minds of the hearers were poisoned against faith. So, let's chat about this for just a minute. Have you ever had your mind poisoned against something? Like you look back and, and somebody said something about something that kind of changed the trajectory of, of what you thought about something? Have you ever, um, there's a restaurant here locally that um, I, for years, loved their bread. Loved it. 
I loved it. It was, it was the greatest bread that you could get. And I always had a piece or two before I had a meal until somebody came along and said, you know that there is mayonnaise on that bread, like baked into the bread, there's mayonnaise. And since that point, I have not been able to eat the bread <laughs> because my mind was poisoned against it. Now, I also don't like mayonnaise. It wasn't the other person's fault. They just pointed out the truth. They didn't tell me anything that wasn't true. But, but, but that's the idea of having our mind poisoned against something. Ha, ha, have one of your friends had previous dealings with somebody that you didn't know? And based on their complaints about that person, that's how you see that person, even though you don't know who they are. You already don't like them because you can't. You know their baggage. You, you know everything about them, even though you don't. So sometimes we don't give people a chance. Your mind has been poisoned against them before you've ever had a conversation with them. Do you think this happens sometimes in churches today? Well, sure it does. Sure it does. How might this happen to us today? In Acts 14, the Jews are probably calling Paul a criminal to try to invalidate anything that he would say about the cross of Jesus. And in the minds of people who don't know this guy, they see him that way. And they don't think he's worth listening to. They are poisoning the minds of the hearers. So Paul and Barnabas have to speak boldly through that poison. They hear that some people want to take their lives so they flee and they preach the gospel wherever they go. Now look at the next section of text. That's the introduction to this main section, verse 8 of Acts 14. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of, uh, of like nature with you, and we bring you good news so that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Again, we see set up right before our eyes the followers of Jesus seeking submission and humility and obedience and sacrifice. And we see in the world pride. Why does it say, what does it say about the miracle that people wanted to offer sacrifice to Barnabas and Paul? It's a legit miracle. I think we can be in agreement about that. And so Paul has the ability to perform this legitimate miracle. I mean this legitimate miracle, but doesn't want any validation or credit. He wants no worship. The thing about church strategy from time to time is that with higher numbers and more people following and all of the lauding that comes from, quote, successful ministries, the temptation is for the leader to accept all of that praise and all of that glory and all of that honor for himself. 
And Paul wants no part of that. He wants no credit for himself. And even the words, as passionately as Paul speaks them, Paul seeks to turn over all glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Now I want to show you one other thing. I want to read a couple more verses together and then I want us to ask a few questions. Acts 14 verse 19. This sets up the stage. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Let me ask kind of a rhetorical question. If Paul's walking in all this power, if he's able to perform these incredible signs and wonders, so much so that people actually want to worship him, why are the people so easily persuaded to stone him because their minds have been poisoned. That's the power. And immediately after being stoned, Paul continues to preach. I mean, that's some tenacity in the Apostle Paul. Sometimes I read passages like this and I wonder of myself, would I be willing to pay the price, right? Would I be willing to sacrifice so much? I mean, Paul is stoned to the point where they think he's dead. They drugged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead, and he gets up and preaches the next day. And it's, it's, it's this kind of character that Paul just has, it seems, like in spades where we compare ourselves against Paul and we say, I, I, don't know if I, could, I don't know if I could ever do that. I want to give you the good news. And I want you to hear it. God doesn't ask you to be Paul. There's a reason that Paul was chosen to do what he did. And God doesn't ask you to be that. God asks you to be you. And in whatever way He asks you to serve Him, in whatever way He asks you to submit to Him, in whatever way He asks you to obey Him, be willing to do that. And maybe on one day it is being stoned, but probably not. Maybe He asks you to be the most faithful person that you know how to be in your line of work to be faithful to your children, to be faithful to your spouse, to be faithful to your career, to be faithful to the church. Maybe He asks you to have that conversation with that person that you've been thinking about. You don't have to be stoned and then preach in Derby. You don't. That was Paul's lot. That was Paul's call. That was Paul's commission. And he said yes. What God wants from you is for you to say yes. Even though the minds of people have been poisoned against us? Absolutely. (laughs) To say yes and to square up culture and to engage with culture and to say yes to God, that's what He wants from you. 
And I think that's what Acts is teaching us as the gospel is in motion in our own hearts. You don't have to sign up and to intentionally force yourself to be stoned and then wake up the next day and preach in Derby. What God asks of you who've had the gospel in motion in your own heart is to say yes to the next thing He calls you to. And then to say yes the next day. And to say yes the next day. That's what He wants from you. That's what He wants you to do. Don't define success by popularity or with numbers or with everybody eating out of your hands and saying you're the greatest thing ever. That isn't inherently successful. In fact, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul experienced the other. Whatever it is the Lord calls you to do, be willing to do. And the other thing that the book of Acts teaches us over and over and over again is whatever He calls you to do, He's going to equip you for. There's not a job He'll give you, there's not a thing He'll call you to do where He won't say, here's the tools to do it. The same was true for the Apostle Paul. You don't have to suffer in the same way that Paul did. You have to be willing to. So take some inventory. Take some inventory personally. What are you willing to do? Let's pray together. God, as we start a new year, I pray that you would be with us. And Father, I pray that we would do the hard work of asking ourselves, what are we willing to do? Father, we're thankful for this book. We're thankful for this study. We pray that you would bless us as we continue on at the next time. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Be blessed this week.